you are live now. Good morning, everybody. This is Michael Lee at the Bruegel Institute in Brussels, welcoming you to this discussion with Vice President Vera Jourova of the European Commission. This is one of a series of discussions organized jointly by Bruegel and the Financial Times. I'm very happy to have Michael Peel uh, from the Financial Times with us this morning. He stepped in at the last moment to replace Sam Fleming, who was called away on another urgent story. So Michael, thanks very much for stepping in. We're very happy to have you, have you with us. Thank I'd you. just like to tell the uh, participants that you have an opportunity to ask questions using the Slido app. If you go to the Slido app and you put in the code um, EU2020, this will bring you straight to our session and you can input questions and I will then select and relay questions to uh, the Vice President. So Vice President, just to get us started, I wonder if you could tell us about your title, which is Vice President for Values and Transparency. I have a reasonable sense of the range of issues that covers, but could you share with us um, your sense of the main thrust of your mission? Mm. It sounds good, doesn't it? Such a such a title. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for for inviting me, but also for for this first question, values uh, and transparency. Well, uh, if I am to be concrete, uh, for me the values which uh, uh, should connect us in the EU, because EU is not only a single market. Uh, it's uh, first of all the rule of law and respect for the law. Nobody should be above the law. That's why I'm focusing on independent judiciary in the member states and uh, also uh, the, the values like active citizenship and freedom of speech, uh, uh, freedoms as such. Uh, and uh, especially in COVID times, uh, this uh, portfolio I have is, is gaining more importance, I, I would say. Uh, and, and very strong commitment, well, I, I feel, uh, in, in this job. Transparency, well, uh, that's uh, the part uh, of my work which relates to, uh, I think, promoting the principle that we should do things in transparent way so that the people know what we are planning and what we are doing and who is advising us and who is lobbying us and uh, uh, to, be, to be open, to be transparent, to be open. And it means that uh, we could be better in this uh, through our procedures at the Commission, but also in the European Parliament, in the Council. Uh, because what uh, I see as a very serious criticism, and I hear it very often, that uh, the EU is sometimes behaving as a, as a black box, that the people do not understand, they do not know what we plan, they are not able to uh, grasp the, the special uh, Euro jargon, which I hate myself, but I use it as well, unfortunately. <clears throat> so uh, I think that these are long-term tasks, and uh, I try to do my best. When I was uh, dealing with enlargement with the Czech Republic and other countries that joined the European Union in the early part of the century, one of the things we used to think was that up to the moment when a country signed an accession treaty with the European Union, um, the Commission had a pretty str uh, strong um, influence with that country in terms of democratic reforms, rule of law, protection of human rights, and so on. But from the moment when the country is sure of becoming a member, and even more when it becomes a member state, we don't have the same leverage. Do you think that's a fair observation? Or do you think that we have developed ways and means, meanwhile, that mean that even when a country is a full member along with the, all the others, nonetheless, they still have responsibilities to live up to in the area of human rights, democracy, and rule of law? Mm. Well, I, I think that uh, in our rules, there is projected some kind of prediction that once the state becomes the member state, uh, it will come automatically that the principles will be uh, 
upheld uh, at the level of the member state, especially the principles of rule of law, democracy, fundamental rights, it is uh, it was meant that it will be a given, some something automatic, uh, which does not require uh, to to uh, for the Commission as the guardian of the treaty to have very strong tools in hand. We have tools. We have tools uh, which uh, enable us to do the, my, by many uh, understood as an unpopular job, but to launch the infringement procedures. We have the Article 7, which we triggered uh, at, in case of Poland and, and Hungary. And uh, we uh, have to be very precise in analyzing whether the member states are breaching the EU rules or not, because if yes, then we can use this toolbox. But at the same time, uh, I, I think that we, we should only uh, limit to, to these uh, tools in, in our hands. Uh, I believe in diplomacy, in dialogue with the member states. As, as Justice Commissioner, I, I launched a lot of infringements. And always before I did it, I spoke to the member state. And I, I try to convince uh, to, to change the thing so that we do not have to use this uh, infringement tool. And uh, also because I felt that we are uh, not sufficiently equipped to push the member states to protect uh, rule of law and, and, and uh, democratic principles and limitation of powers and all these things. I proposed in 2017 to connect the money and the rule of law principle. Now we are in a very hot moment when we negotiate a new budget for the next seven years. And I really believe that this conditionality is fair, it's necessary because the taxpayer in, in the EU want uh, the rule of law to be, to be respected in all the member states. And uh, if not, then there should be some financial sanction. And I never called this conditionality as a sanction, <laughs> but uh, uh, at some moment uh, it might come uh, uh, to, to the scene that uh, this might be this might be used. Vice President, could I push a little further on that? Do you get the feeling that there's going to be a consensus among the member states in favor of giving the EU more teeth, if you will, um, through this financial sanction? Because I think many people agree with you that the existing mechanisms are useful, but are a little bit limited when it comes to um, enforcement. Uh, we have Article 7, we have infringement procedures, uh, and, and so on. And it's often been said that really financial measures would be needed. Do you feel that this one is going to fly with the member states? Mm. What I hear from all the member states, with the emphasis on all, is that we in our country have the rule of law in order. We are okay. I hear it from all the member states. That's why I would suppose that uh, there will be positive reaction from all, all the member states for, for this uh, arrangement. So, of course, there were many uh, critical comments that we should uh, not come with some very vague uh, method or uh, method uh, based on wake uh, assessment of the situation in the country. That's why we, we made this proposal very concrete. We enumerated uh, the concrete situations which might trigger using uh, this instrument. Uh, and it is still in, in the proposal. We are uh, proposing very fair but strong voting system for the council. Uh, a reversed uh, uh, qualified majority, uh, which might mean that indeed we could use this uh, this tool if necessary, and we would not need all the member states at that moment on board. So I predict uh, we will have the consensus. Uh, uh, I hope so. We need it. We have any need it. I saw that you were speaking with the European Parliament this morning um, in the debate that they had over, over Hungary. And uh, just last week, I read the report from Freedom House, which for the first time reached the conclusion that um, applying their own criteria, of course, that may be objective, but are perhaps distinct from those that we use uh, in the EU, they're probably overlapping though, 
they reached for the first time the conclusion that a member state of the European Union could not be considered to be a democracy, even under qualified terms. Instead, they characterized Hungary as a hybrid transitional regime. And they used the same categorization for the two countries that are most advanced in the accession process, Serbia and Montenegro. This is a grave cause for concern. And I know there were discussions this morning in the parliament. And one of the questions there is what the European People's Party should do about the 13 MEPs from the Hungarian ruling party, Fidesz. They've suspended their membership indefinitely, but they are reluctant to expel them from the group. After the debate this morning, what kind of feeling do you have about the mood in the European Parliament and the extent to which you can really count on the Parliament to back up your efforts? I, I would leave this for, for the EPP uh, to decide on that. Uh, but uh, you ask me about my feeling after this morning debate. Uh, still fresh memory, it's true. <laughs> um, I was sitting there and I heard very, uh, how to say, uh, very clear messages from both camps. Uh, one camp says, uh, do not touch the sovereign states. This is their, purely their matter, uh, if I simplify that. Uh, the other camp is uh, saying for a long time that the commission should be stronger in responding uh, the, on, on these uh, varying trends in, in the member states. And I, I was sitting in the middle and I tried to explain that, that the commission can only use the tools and, and the, the cards we have in hands. I, I strongly believe that it's not a weakness to play according to the rules. Yeah? But at the same time, uh, we need to be, be very clear and vocal and concrete in what we criticize because it should be very clear that we cannot cover all the rule of law issues by infringements. But at the same time, there are the varying trends, which uh, uh, by the way, led also to the Article 7 uh, procedure. So, so my feeling is uh, we have to do more. Uh, we must not forget that it is first of all for the Hungarian voters to decide. So we should be, uh, much better in protecting the free and fair elections in all the member states, including Hungary, uh, because uh, the voters sh should have a clear say. The voters should have an access to unbiased, uh, wide spectrum of opinions. That's why I'm very vocal on worrying that the freedom of speech is at stake in Hungary, that we need the media to freely uh, write about the situation and be critical. That's why we have concerns about the, uh, the criminal offense which appeared uh, in, the, in the Hungarian legal order. And, and so I, I would like to continue with the combination of the legal actions, uh, the political declarations and, and clear positioning and here my role of, of the commissioner responsible for values is, uh, you know, the Czech Eurosceptics, they always say that uh, my portfolio is only words and no, no real work. <laughs> this is, this is the, the beautiful words. Yeah, beautiful. Sometimes not so beautiful. I, I try to use objective words based on facts and, and evidence. And the third part must be the continuous dialogue. That's why I am in continuous dialogue with the, with the Hungarian Minister of Justice. I'm listening to what she's saying. I'm, I'm listening when she's telling me that she would like to have better access to Western media to explain. It's her job. Let her do her job. But, but we, we need to be much, much better in, in pushing. Uh, and when I say we, I don't mean the commission only. It cannot be done only by the commission. That's why I rely on the council, on the club of states, uh, which uh, should be maybe more concrete and more targeted in what they do not like yes. in the countries like Hungary. I, I receive a lot of complaints from, from the businesses, uh, also from the businesses who do business in Poland, but especially in Hungary, they complain about the lack of legal certainty. 
and about the pressures. And I, I my question, my answer to them is to go and be vocal, speak about that. But uh, it will take more time. Anyway, I hope that this emergency time, uh, which is a stress test for health, for economy, but also for democracy, that we will survive it, that the democracy will survive, that we will come to old normal, and that we will continue also the dialogue with Hungary. Exactly. I think that last point that you made is very much in line with questions that we've been receiving, but I think you've addressed them really about whether um, emergency situations are providing pretext for um, interfering with normal democratic processes. And I think we can see the risk of that, and you referred to it yourself, and it's particularly, you, you mentioned stress test of democracy, I like that phrase. And we want to see, and we trust, that we and all our member states will pass that stress test. Yeah. Michael, would you like to jump in at this point? Yeah, thank, thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'd like to just go back to your, your appearance this morning in, which, in the Parliament, in which you, you talked about the uh, chilling effect or the potential chilling effect of the uh, so-called fake news law in Hungary, um, threatening people with, with up to five years in jail. Um, but this is more than an abstract worry now, isn't it? We've seen two cases this week, a 64-year-old man um, detained uh, over a Facebook post on, on Tuesday describing Viktor Orban as dictator. And then on Wednesday, an opposition uh, activist detained um, for uh, writing about empty hospital beds in his hometown. This is citizens being arrested for speech in a European Union country. Were you prepared to condemn that? And what are you going to do about it? Well, of course, I'm prepared to condemn that. Uh, it is. Uh, it was at the beginning when when this law, uh, emergency law, uh, introduced this uh, possible penalization of the critical comments. Uh, uh, I, I already expressed my my worries that it will have the chilling effect. I, I discussed with the with the uh, Hungarian journalists. I have every day update from our permanent representation of the situation. So so I know these concrete two cases. Uh, what the journalists in uh, fr from Hungary are telling me up to now, it has not uh, affected uh, the the journalists personally. But of course, uh, when we see the cases where criminal comments, uh, cr uh, critical comments uh, can uh, invoke this reaction of the uh, law enforcement bodies, it is, it is worrying. Uh, and uh, what we have concerns about is uh, the rather vague definition of what is fake news, which can be, which can be penalized. So, uh, I believe this has chilling effect. It could impose some kind of self self censor censorship on on the, on the journalists because it's not only the pressure from the state, but it's also the pressure from the social media. They are uh, subjects of of everyday intensive attacks from 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 different people, and. Uh, uh, we uh, we are of course following the situation and and uh, in case of need we will we will come with the action but in the in the world of media and, and criminal law uh, we have rather limited uh, limited power on this at the same time speaking about fake news uh, you know that at the level of the of the commission or, or for, the, for the union we would like to come with some rules I'm extremely worried uh, not to introduce something or not to give it first impulse for, for creation of some kind of censorship. Yeah, this, th this is uh, very sensitive and uh, very dangerous. Uh, COVID crisis showed uh, also what was reported by the platforms that uh, there is an increased uh, demand for the truth from the people. Yeah, because they are worried, uh, they they are they scared about the the the, the, the corona and uh, uh, so. Uh, but but it will it will not not last forever, fortunately, and we will have to come back to to the old normal and and set some rules. But you are saying that you think those two cases that we got unacceptable. Well, I think it's it's what I see unacceptable is that there is such a publicity around that, that the people are known 
that uh, there is no protection of, of identity of the people. Uh, they are detained, they are released then, but uh, already these, uh, these uh, actions have effect on, on, on the society and of course also effect on the, on the persons at stake because uh, this is a very, very uh, difficult moment for the people. You mentioned the tools the EU has to combat um, alleged rule of law breaches, and you mentioned uh, Article 7. Um, it's now almost two and a half years uh, since the Commission launched the Article 7 case against Poland. Um, it's um, now um, coming up to a year and a half, or just over a year and a half, the case began against Hungary. Um, they've gone nowhere, haven't they? I mean, Article 7, regardless of the arguments about whether um, it, it, there are double standards in the EU, on its own terms, Article 7 has failed, hasn't it? I mean, th these cases have not progressed at all and they are just in a stalemate. We don't have anything stronger. That's why I propose the conditionality for the money. Uh, I sometimes say, uh, maybe it sounds cynical, but uh, who doesn't understand the values might understand the money. Uh, so that's why I, I really tried to, in, to enlarge uh, the possibilities. On Article 7, uh, I don't think it is completely useless. It's a little bit of a Tao uh, philosophy that the process is the goal uh, here. Uh, uh, the legislators, when they introduced this article in the Lisbon Treaty, maybe they, did, they didn't have enough fantasy that it might happen, that it will not be only one state with systemic breach of rule of law, that there will be two states and that there will be several other states who, which out of some maybe geographical or historical solidarity will remain silent. This is not how the uh, creator of the, uh, creators of the Lisbon Treaty uh, pre predicted that this will be used. So but let's face it, yes, the article seven. That, no? They, Sorry? Should have, they should have predicted that, shouldn't they? I mean, it's it's not an implausible scenario. Well, it just just shows that uh, well, the Lisbon Treaty was uh, adopted uh, after the big accession wave when Michael did his good job in Czechoslovakia <laughs> or Czech Republic, <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of optimism and uh, a lot of. Uh, I don't know, uh, very maybe in, from today's point of view, naive ideas that the rule of law and the, the fundamental rights and, and the, the, the freedoms are given. We see it's, it's, not, it's not like that in practice. So I, I don't want to criticize the creators of the Lisbon Treaty. Maybe one of the lessons after COVID will be, let's look into how the processes are designed and uh, who can do what. Uh, and uh, I will be happily uh, participating in this debate because, uh, believe me, I am rather frustrated that we cannot uh, impose more pressure. On the other side, I have to say, uh, and maybe that's my, my uh, central European instinct, uh, there were free elections in Hungary. I believe it. Uh, they, they were free. And Fidesz party and Viktor Orban got very strong support from the voters, from the citizens of a sovereign state. Uh, they still have high, high uh, level of popularity and uh, we cannot uh, oversee this. This is what, what we, we have to count with. And, that's why this morning I, uh, I could not resist and I, I recalled the memories from before 1989 when the people desired to, for, for freedom. They wanted to be free. They wanted to read free speech. They wanted to have free elections. They wanted to have the referee, the independent judge in the country. Which will, enable, which will guarantee that there will be nobody ever above the law. I think we should be better in reminding ourselves of, of these big values. Uh, so uh, I cannot tell you more on that. Uh, Article 7, yes, uh, we have to continue. We have to continue. We have to have another debate and uh, the member states should take a position. 
you mentioned elections. Um, obviously, Poland has been in the news over its presidential election, which which has been postponed, but it may be held um, quite soon. Um, in the past, you've said that uh, obviously elections are a matter of national sovereignty, but they should take place according to EU values. Um, but you can't run a presidential election by post, can you? You can't have a proper campaign by by post in a time of, of lockdowns and immense disruption to societies. Is, is there any circumstance in which you could, any country can hold a, a fair election in those circumstances? Well, of course, to organize the elections by post, by using purely or fresh, fresh new system, which the people do not know. And uh, to organize the elections under the, the health uh, threat or in the in the atmosphere when when the, the, the people are locked down and uh, where where the candidates do not have a chance to go and speak to the voters directly of course this is a very risky endeavor which uh, of course uh, is uh, raising doubts whether such elections can be legal and and uh, whether the winning candidate can can be recognized as the the winner of the free elections these were and these are our concerns. And it was quite obvious that the Polish authorities, the Polish part, uh, leading party, realized that this is too risky. That's why they are postponing it. The concerns remain because uh, the parameters for free and fair elections are always the same. There are good habits, there are international rules, there are very clear criteria for free and fair elections and they should be uh, uh, guaranteed even in the times of, of crisis. To do it by post, uh, I, I, I hope I'm not mistaken, but it's the method used in, in some other places in Europe. But it's not a new method. It's the method the people know. It's the method which respects the data privacy. And so it's the method which is not increasing the health uh, uh, threat or health risk. So uh, uh, indeed, there will be several other elections so by the end of this year, and I am considering whether we should not consult with the member states how to guarantee fair fair elections in the times of crisis of COVID. Uh, I think it's very relevant and co constructive approach. I, I want to apply some some kind of commission guidance. You're thinking of. Uh, not, I would not go so far because, uh, as you mentioned, uh, this is the sovereign competence. Uh, but uh, we already created the election networks, uh, a network before the European Parliament elections, mm -hmm. which is the European competence. And we were discussing with the member states' representatives, those who organize the net, also also the national elections, how to uh, address the new risks risks to privacy, this reference to Cambridge Analytica case, remember, highly relevant topic, the, the cyber security issues, how to address the issue of online advertising and transparency of online adver advertising and so on. And, and when you look at these new risks, which we tried to uh, tackle together with the member states uh, around one table, we have now one more very dangerous pupil in this classroom, and it's COVID, COVID-19. And, and we, we have to think about how to combine these two things, that even in the times of COVID, we uh, have to guarantee the basic principles. And uh, so I, I'm thinking about some, some, some dialogue or some, some, some discussion, best practices, uh, probably not guidance. I would not go that far. We're getting some comments from uh, participants, uh, some who agree that uh, distance voting may, under some circumstances, uh, respect the health considerations at times like this. Um, others who are particularly concerned that COVID should not be used as a, as a, as a pretext mm. for limiting the kind of freedoms that we're used to. But maybe we could just move on a little bit and use that as a hook. Because um, an, another concern coming out of COVID-19 um, and the kind of measures that might be necessary to move towards a safe recovery is the question of uh, data privacy and uh, 
individual freedom in, in relation to that. And particularly, discussions underway also yesterday with the publication of the Commission's views about uh, promoting tourism and so on, how we could get to that. And um, the idea that tracing might be important in various situations, learning lessons from some countries in Asia and elsewhere, and the efforts that have been underway to try and see if the member states could agree amongst themselves on an app um, that would be used and would, which would guarantee individual privacy, but would also enable the authorities, if necessary, to trace individuals who might be involved with clusters of contagion. Those are complex issues. And um, also it's complicated by commercial considerations as to which app should be adopted. What do you see as the way forward in this rather tangled web of issues? Well, we live in the time when we see that technology can be used for many good things. And the Commission took this positive stance on, on the efforts of the states to develop the, the tracing apps and also, also the, the efforts of the private sector to, to come with such innovations. Uh, at the same time, in Corona time, uh, as I always say that the constitutions cannot be switched off. Also GDPR cannot be switched off. Yeah? We achieved a big thing in, in Europe. We have respect for the privacy of every individual. That's why the commission reacted very promptly on, on the national solutions uh, with the guidance, uh, which set several rules. Uh, uh, first of all, that uh, an app uh, can be, as a, as a user's device, uh, be only used as a voluntary uh, measure. So with the, with the clear consent of each individual that, yes, I want to be part of this. So, so voluntary and well-informed uh, decision of each individual. Uh, uh, there should not be any use of geolocation data. Uh, then also that the personal data that are necessary to meet the purpose of the ad, uh, app uh, uh, can be processed and retained for a very limited period of time. And uh, also uh, the principle that uh, the tools should be used uh, for a strictly limited time period. Uh, these, these are the, the basic principles. Of course, the, it was a little bit more uh, concrete and technologically demanding for, for me, <laughs> this guidance. But uh, uh, I think that this is a very clear message for the member states use it, but make sure there are these principles up, upheld. And very crucial role for the data protection authorities. Yeah, and that's why uh, I am quite glad that uh, they follow uh, each of these new technological endeavors that the European Data Protection Board is, is uh, uh, up, up and uh, running the, the assessment. And uh, uh, I think that we are doing, doing well in this relation. Let's hope it helps because uh, uh, this uh, technological solution for tracing and sufficient capacity for testing this might be second best solution. Of course, the first best best is to have the vaccine. Yeah, but um, yeah. 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 Yeah, Michael. Yeah, um, on contact tracing commissioning, there's been some debate, as, as you know, about um, how effective app-based contract contact tracing is compared to more traditional methods um, of phone calls, house calls, and, and so on. Um, have you uh, done any analysis on that? Have you come to any conclusions um, from, from other countries' experience about how, how effective are um, apps in, in this? I mean, are they as, uh, as, uh, as crucial as, as people, some people make out? Well, it's true, uh, to be very honest, that we were focusing on more on the risks and on, on those safeguards from the privacy uh, point of view. But uh, uh, the experts say that there must be suffi sufficient people participating in, in this uh, 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 and, and, and uh, being, uh, being somehow involved in this app uh, function, functional, uh, uh, functioning. Uh, otherwise, it will not be uh, efficient enough. But, but again, the, the, what the experts say, uh, who used to do the, the tracing by means of a phone call and by using just the memory of the people, 
they say that there is a considerable difference between those two methods. And otherwise that they could not continue using the old method because it was not efficient enough. Uh, so uh, we will, we will uh, now we adopted the tourism package where uh, we have a, a reference to these apps that uh, they should be uh, somehow interconnected so that it is one of the enabling factors uh, enabling for the possibility to travel uh, across the borders. Tourism is suffering, the people are hungry, uh, uh, zero income. This is really a tragedy for, for the tourism sector. So if we can use the technology also to uh, start the, the tourism again, let, let's do that. Let's do that. You think that they should remain voluntary or do you think it's reasonable for a member state to require them as a condition for crossing the border? That, that should be uh, regained the free decision of the people. This is the basic principle. Yeah, the people should be co uh, convinced to do that, but not, not to push to do that. It's, it's my clear point. You mentioned uh, GDPR, uh, Commissioner, which is obviously something very, very close to your heart. Um, do you think that there's a danger, as some people suggest, that uh, big tech companies will try to exploit the inevitable erosion of privacy that we see in this crisis um, to make it permanent, um, because obviously they have strong commercial interests in in doing that. And uh, if, if so, what kind of safeguards um, do you think are needed to stop that happening? I, I heard two kinds of concerns, one relating to the big tech. But it's a long lasting concern that they know everything about us. And in spite of GDPR, they are watching what we are doing. And, you know, th this is uh, this is a very, very uh, tough, uh, tough game uh, because inevitably they have access to to our private data uh, and GDPR tries to address that. But a new kind of concern is whether the states might not have appetite to have the society under better, better control using these, these technological uh, innovations. And here, my message is very clear. Uh, let's come back to old, good, normal times when GDPR applies in full. Because what's happening now is that uh, member states are accessing the private data uh, uh, by using the special articles for these kind of situations. Yeah, but these situations are must be time limited, so it has to come back. And uh, I think GDPR is a, is an efficient tool. We are now uh, finalizing the assessment. Uh, uh, we will publish the review of uh, how GDPR is functioning in June, and uh, I'm sure we will also reflect on on how GDPR worked in the in the crisis time. And can you give us a little preview of your your conclusions okay. next month? How do you think GDPR has functioned? Uh, it functions well. Uh, it requires uh, some more clarity, uh, especially in relation to small and medium enterprises, because not uh, the, the problem of GDPR is that uh, there is no size limitation. There, there are obligations for those who process the private data, and it can be even a very small company. So we, we, we need to maybe bring more, more clarification uh, we uh, should guarantee, and it was my input into this assessment, that GDPR will not be will used as, as excuse for not delivering information for the journalists, but also for not deli delivering the, the, the data from the platforms to the scientists, because these are recent cases, which I have on my table and, and here. Uh, when I hear, when I when I'm listening to the excuses that due to GDPR we cannot deliver the, the data or the information, uh, this was not this was not the purpose of GDPR, to limit the access to information from the public side. So so the, these are just two things which are dear to my heart, uh, where I really try to uh, reflect it in the GDPR review, and of course also the the data uh, transfers uh, to the third countries. We, we need to uh, review the, the regimes we have with this uni uh, United States, its privacy shield, but with, with 11 other countries where we have adequacy decisions 
we are now looking into how, how we can continue. Commissioner, moving on, um, you've been particularly outspoken after the judgment of the German Constitutional Court um, in affirming um, the primacy, of course, of uh, EU law, um, the whole question of uh, whether uh, this was ultra virus and where we go from here. I wonder if you would share with us some of your thoughts about the implications of the recent court judgment. Hmm. Uh, immediately after the ruling, we, we uh, announced that for us, there are several basic principles which must remain untouched. And it is the role of the ECJ, uh, European Court of Justice, as the, as the uh, last resort uh, arbiter or interpreter of the EU law. The second uh, is the uh, primacy of, of the EU law, as, as you mentioned. Also, we defended the European uh, Central Bank as independent body. So th these were immediate declarations, but, but it will require more time for our lawyers to analyze the judgment and to decide on the, on the next steps on that. So I cannot re re reveal you more, more than that. For me, this is uh, a very special moment because, you know, I deal with the rule of law issues for several years already, and, and especially the Polish uh, judiciary reform. In, in relation to that, I, I always said that the commission is not the policeman and the commission is not the judge. We have the European Court of Justice to, to, to take decisions which will not be put into question, that they will be fully respected by everybody. Uh, and suddenly I see that uh, to weaken this pillar, to put into question the role of the ECJ would, be, would really have far reaching consequences for the EU legal order uh, and for, for many things related to functioning of the EU. So it, it's just my, my feeling uh, and we have to wait for the legal assessment. Michael. Yes, I mean, my uh, colleague, uh, Martin Wolf from the Financial Times did describe the, the German uh, judgment as an act of judicial secession. Um, I mean, do you think people appreciate fully the, the, the seriousness of this? And are you worried about um, a copycat effect, which is that any country which doesn't feel like following EU laws can now use this as a, a justification? Uh, well, as I said, this is a serious moment. And I do believe that the judgments of the ECJ will be respected. We have now the, the several infringement cases uh, relating to the rule of law, where, as I said before, I, I, I really 100% rely on the respect of, of these judgments. And whether the people realize, uh, well, th these matters always seem to be uh, the theoretical or even academic debate of some very narrow group of people, the constitutional lawyers and, uh, and, and, and legal experts, but, but this might have consequences on, on every citizen. So that's why I, I think that it's very important that the commission stands firm on, on the principles and that we, we will come with, with the legal analysis later. And uh, uh, what else to say? I, I spoke yesterday to the Minister of Justice of, of Germany and, and uh, we discussed this and uh, of course she said we have to respect the, the, the decision of the, of the Federal Court of Justice. Uh, <laughs> but, and we respect it as well, but this is a purely new situation. But that, that's the trap, isn't it? Because if you took an infringement action, it would be against the German government, which doesn't have a power over the ruling of the German constitutional court. So Indeed. There, there is no tool. Indeed. No. It's only one item on the list of other complications. Mm -hmm. Yes. But we are at the cross crossroad with this. Uh, also with, uh, if I may say, with what is the, the power of the European institutions uh, as such, you know, the Commission, as I said, we have very weak toolbox uh, to, to, to uh, take legal steps uh, on, on really big issues. Uh, so so we, uh, we have to consider whether the system works well, but uh, I would very much plea on not destroying the basic principles. 
We live in uncertain times, not only in COVID, uh, you know, last commission, uh, last mandate, I remember well, it was crisis after crisis. And the best way to get through all those crises was to obey the rules and stabilize the situation with the, with the combination of legal and diplomatic tools. We have to continue that. Are there specific extra legal tools that we haven't discussed so far that you think would be helpful for the Commission to have? Uh, it, it's for further discussion. Uh, I, I cannot tell you now, I am sometimes frustrated when I say that not all the rule of law issues or not all the fundamental rights issues can be just addressed by our action. Yeah, uh, But many other people would tell you this is the right balance of competencies. There must be remained a lot for the sovereign states to decide. Yeah, so so you see how, how serious this debate is that we are touching the core principles, and and division of powers and uh, the functionality of the whole system. I'm getting uh, questions on diverse subjects. I'd like to share one or two of them with you. Yes. Um, there's a question which is asking you to comment on the situation in Malta and on the findings of the public inquiry on Daphne Caruana's um, assassination and the implications that um, those in government might have shared some responsibility. Could you comment on that? The family of Daphne Caruana Galizia is still waiting for justice and also is still facing the, the litigations. Uh, uh, after uh, after Daphne and, and her work, and the history shows that she was right on m many of the of the critical comments. She was right. She was doing the right job by by being courageous and dis disclosing the 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 negative things. And she she was murdered, and that's why the Commission keeps pushing the Maltese law enforcement authorities to do more to not only to detain and, and penalize those who executed the murder, but those who ordered that. It still remained unclear. So that's why uh, I am in, in, I use every possibility to, to push uh, the, the Maltese government and Maltese uh, authorities to, to continue on that. And in Malta, I, I planned to go there. Uh, it was planned, I think, for the end of, of March. Uh, because there is uh, the new government, which promised a lot of things, including the reform of criminal justice system, of prosecutor's office, and and uh, some other other mat matters. Uh, so I I will go there when when it uh, it's possible because uh, I I also want to understand the situation very well in the country, and it's necessary to be there and speak to the people. But but for on the murder, I repeatedly offered the help of Eurojust and Europol, uh, that there was a re really very strong and still is very strong pressure from outside on Malta on this. A, a Malta-related question, um, which also relates to Cyprus and, and Bulgaria in particular about the so-called golden passports. Um, <laughs> The, the schemes that they run. Um, this is also um, obviously something that, that you've worked on and uh, extends far beyond into golden visa schemes in many, most EU countries. Um, there were supposed to be new guidelines on this due before the end of last year when the, the member states were supposed to be pulling these together. They still haven't appeared. Um, I mean, it doesn't seem as if EU member states are taking this as seriously as they should, does it? I mean, this is a serious problem that people from all kinds of countries, and we've seen some high profile cases of people who should not have been given passports in, in Cyprus, for example, who, who did get them. Um, and yet there's no action on this. Is that troubling you to you? I am disappointed by that. I would not say that there seems to be not, not enough interest. There is not enough interest from the other member states. And I had big expectations that we will uh, together uh, create better system of uh, scrutinizing uh, the, the, the countries which are selling the passports. Uh, uh, because 
there is something elementary unfair. Uh, the, the countries you mentioned are selling, but Bulgaria, I think, is now leaving the system. I, I don't know the, the update, but I don't want to be unfair. But at least Malta and Cyprus, they are selling something they do not own. They are selling European citizenship. Yeah, that's, that's the issue at stake. And by selling the passports to the people who might be dangerous also uh, for security of Europeans, I, I really honestly believed that the other states will welcome the possibility to have this better under control and that we will together develop a system where uh, there will be much stricter and much more perfect uh, due diligence of, of those who are applying, that the member states will have a chance to veto such a procedure, th things like that. Because uh, legally speaking, the Commission cannot stop it, but maybe we, could, uh, we should look again at, at the legal competences, and uh, I, I don't want to give up on that. But on, on this phase, and you have good information. It was meant to be finished by the end of this year. It is delayed now. But on, on this uh, on this phase, I am disappointed. But I, I don't know the the fresh update. Uh, it's uh, in the remit of Didier Rangers, who is very intensively working on on finding a better solution. We are not giving up, but it's not an, an easy task. Perhaps to wrap up our discussion. And thanks for being so forthcoming with us this afternoon. Uh, participants have been asking about how democracy can be reinforced at different levels and doesn't it differ at various levels, at the local level, regional, national, EU level. Um, it seems that there's a scheme supported by a group in Austria uh, to promote a European capital of democracy inspired by the European capital of culture Maybe the middle of um, an epidemic is not the right moment, maybe for some of these initiatives. But thinking also about the conference on the future of Europe that had to be postponed uh, as a result of the epidemic. And that was going to be an opportunity for citizens to make their voices heard and perhaps to overcome the argument that the EU has mainly taken steps forward in the past through top-down initiatives and that we should begin listening to the base a little bit more and encouraging citizens themselves to come forward with ideas. Hmm. This is a little bit on the back burner, perhaps now because of the epidemic, but do you see a future for this kind of citizen initiative? Um, do you think that the Conference on the Future of Europe, which was a highly ambitious project that might even eventually have led to treaty changes, um, powered by citizen input. Is this something that now is definitively on the back burner or do you see a future for it? Hmm. Uh, indeed, uh, it's a pity we could not start now in May uh, because it's ambitious, but it's heavily needed. Uh, we need to have open dialogue with the people and, and being also able to explain why the principles of, of democracy and the rule of law are, are important. Democracy is needed on all levels. I, I went through all of them. I started at the city hall <laughs> and then the regional uh, level and the state. And then what a career I ended up in the commission. On all the levels, the democracy is absolutely essential. And uh, what the, the Czech president Masaryk, uh, he always said that democracy is a discussion. That's why it's so important that we have active citizenship guaranteed, freedom of speech and all these things which enable the, the open debate at all the levels. Unfortunately, uh, the capital of democracy or culture, well, uh, we, uh, this is not a fiscal policy where you can count the, the public debt and you say, what is the condition in the state? What, how, what is, uh, how, how good the state uh, is in, in this uh, particular area? Democracy cannot be measured. It cannot be weighed. It, it cannot be somehow quantified. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we will do our best to come with a workable and hopefully trustworthy assessment of the situation of rule of law and, and democracy in the member states. Uh, it will be the rule of law report, which we will publish in September. And uh, I really believe that we might get objective picture of the situation in the member states. 
And you having this evidence and the objective report, I think this will be also a good start for these public debates, which might be organized under the conference or, or on the future of Europe or through other, other arrangements. And, and to discuss the situation in, in the member states and to invite the people to advise what could be done on, on which level and what they themselves could do. Because more and more, I believe, active citizenship, uh, this is so important. For me, uh, totality or totalitarian regime, it's, it's uh, marked especially by uh, threatened passivity of the people. And th this is what, what must, not, uh, must not happen in Europe. Vice President Jourova, thank you so much for being so open and forthcoming thank and uh, responding to our questions and to those of the participants so frankly. It's been a pleasure to have you with us. We wish you every success in your continuing work. Pleasure Thanks very you. much for stepping in, Michael, at the last moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank and you. Goodbye to all our participants. And thank you for inviting me. It was, a, it was an important opportunity for me also to... It's a pleasure. We hope to have future occasions. Thank you very much. Have a Best good day. Thank you.